I'm going to give, I'm Liz Benjamin, by the way. Uh, I used to be a reporter in Albany and also in New York City for about 20 years, covering many different aspects of policy and politics, including housing. And now I have the privilege of being in the private sector, and I work with Shinny to help them, the network, to help them with communications. So it's really a thrill to be here and sort of get to put my old hat back on for a minute, which is always fun. Um, and so I'm going to just introduce uh, these folks very briefly, and then they're going to speak to you a little bit about uh, an overview of what they do and what drives them to continue to do this work, which we know is very rewarding but also very challenging, uh, particularly in this moment that we find ourselves in. And then subsequently we'll get into sort of the meat and potatoes of our discussion, and there will be time for questions uh, at the end. And um, I'm not sure where McLean, McLean, are you still in here? Okay, so um, we do you want to talk to folks about how they should ask questions now, or do you want to do that later? Yeah, no, that's okay. I think towards the end we'll have about 20 minutes for questions, and if people want to just line up here behind this mic, um, you can kind of do it that way. Okay. Um, I believe we might have a floating mic, too, so if there's any issues, I'm happy oh, to Oh, it's back there. Yep, yeah. so if you can't, if you are sort of stuck sure. against the wall and don't want to make your way to the middle, just sort of raise your hand and we will find you with the floating microphone. Uh, so we are joined today by, uh, in no particular order, <laughs> Chinazo Cunningham, who's Commissioner of the State Office of Addiction Services and Supports. I um, introduced you to Thebia, who is also with us, as I mentioned, in um, place of Ruthann Visnauskas. Uh, Anne-Marie Sullivan, Commissioner of the State Office of Mental Health. I know you're familiar with these folks, just making sure. And, and Daniel Teets, Commissioner of the State Office of Temporary and Disability Assistance, also known as OTADA, which is just a lot of fun to say. <laughs> so I, I just, it's a, lot, it's a very serious agency. <laughs> it is fun to say. OK, so, um, and I'll, I'll probably not say it again for the next 50 minutes. Um, so Commissioner, I'm going to ask you, please, if you wouldn't mind to sort of start us off and give us a feeling of what uh, drives you to do this work, how you got here, um, just encapsulate that into like a few minutes, and your vision for. Um, the, the coming months, um, and how particularly you see supportive housing as part of the plan to address the, the current homelessness crisis that we're experiencing in the five boroughs and across the state. And if you feel like it, something fun that nobody knows about you in this room. <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> I don't know if you know, no. no. <laughs> um, oh, 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 thank, thank you so My much. And it, it's a real pleasure to be here, and it, it is just so nice to see everybody. I mean, it really is such a pleasure. And I, I just also have to start um, uh, by thanking you all for everything that you did over these last couple of years throughout the pandemic. You know, um, you, you really kept our clients safe and well and housed and in safe places where they could call home. And you were there for them, you know, 24-7, you know? Um, and we talk about all being involved in this, but you never you never let go, and you really kind of did all the hard work. So thank you. Thank you so much for that. And I think a round of applause for everybody here. You know, just a minute on how I got into this business. I trained at um, Bellevue many years ago. I won't go how far back. But um, I just loved working with um, the clients at Bellevue who had serious, significant mental illness. But uh, those days, there was no housing plan. There were no supported housing. And while I know we fight for every bed we can get, um, it, it was a time when there just weren't any. And there was one program in the city, the St. Francis residence. And I remember my clients at Bellevue, I would go with them to the St. Francis residence. And I never forgot that, because that was a good place they just never had enough beds, <laughs> but it was a good place. It was a good place, and there was real caring and dedication on the part of the staff to work with individuals with serious mental illness. And then I fast forward to um, an opening that was um, maybe it was, a, well, it was before the pandemic, maybe even a year before that, out of um, one of our housing, um, Anne Ronkonkoma on Long Island. And um, I went in. One of the clients was really so thrilled to be able to show his apartment. And um, he was just so proud. And he said to me, um, this is the first time I've ever had my own key to my own place. And I think that's what keeps all of us going. It's that feeling. It's that look of pride and that look of um, recovery that someone has that, you know, this is mine now and this is my place. So I think that's what keeps me going. And um, I also think, though, that um, this year 
Uh, I, it's one of the best years in the budget for housing, for mental health. Um, I know it doesn't solve everything, and I know you guys will be out there pushing harder and harder, but it's the first time I've seen this kind of really uh, robust investment, so I'm very proud of that, too, and be part of the um, Hochul administration that's putting out these dollars and really supporting um, what we need for uh, individuals with uh, serious mental illness. So um, vision for the future. Someone once told me that the three most important, I think I've said this one before, but the three most important things for recovery are um, housing, housing, and housing. And so my vision for the future is to get that, those three things done, to increase the housing. We're at about 50,000 units now across the state, and when I talk to other states, they are just amazed because they don't have anything close to that per capita, but it's not enough. And we know that we need more. And we, my vision for the future eventually would be someday where when someone needed that housing, they could kind of walk right in the door and get that key and they didn't have to wait or go through too many steps or be on a waiting list somewhere. Or, um, but we're getting better. We're getting better. But that's, that would be the ultimate vision. That and working on all the things we're doing for recovery going forward um, in terms of helping individuals become full, fully involved, fully connected to their communities. And housing is such an important part of that. And you're such an important part of that. So I think I'll just um, stop okay. there. And Commissioner, uh, this is so easy. I'll delay. I'll just say, Commissioner, <laughs> don't speak. And then, and then, and then, and then me. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, uh, so, as Commissioner Sullivan said, um, thank you for having us, and thank you for all that you do. I want to encourage the folks at the back of the room to come up front because there's plenty of seats up here. So don't don't feel shy. Just you can just walk forward. It's fine. Um, so, you see, I, I just can't help but be in charge. Just, <laughs> come on, you can um, knock yourself out. So you asked about what drives this. I, I started my career 40 years ago as a registered nurse in a locked inpatient uh, forensic unit, mental health unit, for the State Department of Mental Health in Massachusetts in downtown Boston. It was very rough, um, very messy. Um, you know, folks who got arrested in, in, at, you know, at arraignment didn't seem quite right um, and would be sent to us. And, um, you know, to a person, almost to a person, really, marginalized, um, poor, uh, had a whole host of needs. And it, to, in some instances, the arrest was, it, I hate to say this, but the best thing that could have happened to them at that moment because now they finally got some services. Um, uh, I later went to law school, and I saw that as an opportunity really to, um, you know, use my prior work in direct services to actually work uh, in a bigger way on policy change. And admittedly, my you know, political activity um, was part of that too. So I, I, uh, right, I, I all along really just saw this as um, how do we help folks most in need who are most on the margins, um, who live in poverty and have a whole host of social and uh, health challenges. Um, so I think that's the driver for me. Um, at OTDA, I think you know, our vision for the next 12 to 24 months is really to develop a broad anti-poverty agenda. Um, uh, this governor has committed to an overhaul. Um, I mean, I think it's fair to say that what we're living with um, is, in, in fair part, um, an agenda developed more than 20 years ago um, and really needs reform and, and modernization. Um, and to think differently about how we uh, alleviate poverty, how we serve uh, New Yorkers uh, in low-income households. Um, th our, th the driver for that, I think, will be the, the Child Poverty Reduction Advisory Council. Um, the governor signed that bill in December. Uh, uh, I know we're behind um, in terms of actually organizing the council, but I'm hoping that the first meeting will be in the next month or so. Um, uh, we've now got our appointments and we're working on the vetting and I think we're going to start, start that soon. Um, uh, our goal is to really take that, you know, it's, it, the, the, the bill uh, aims to reduce child poverty in New York by 50% over the next uh, 10 years. We're essentially going to use that as a vehicle to develop a broader agenda because obviously you can't fix 
children's poverty unless you fix your family's poverty. And listen, if you're going to go that far, you might as well fix everybody's poverty. So, um, uh, so they might have children. Yeah, they might have children. <laughs> uh, you know. Um, so, uh, so that for us is is a big driver, which is to figure out how to modernize the work we're doing uh, and bring some reform. Um, I certainly see supportive housing as a big piece of that. Obviously, for someone who's experiencing um, homelessness and has mental health and substance use or uh, uh, other health, health needs where living on their own isn't going to work um, or has been shown not to work, um, supportive housing is really central to that and you know, provides stability in our, our opportunity to serve people um, uh, in their housing and keep them housed, keep them stable, um, to you know, give them a chance at, 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 at you know, a genuine life in the community. Um, so that's, um, that's kind of my story. I think, um, and I know that Commissioner Sullivan didn't answer the question, but um, so um, uh, I would say, you know, my husband and I love travel. And now for me, that's, that's um, usually a beach somewhere. Um, uh, I prefer it was hot all the time everywhere. I don't know why I live here. Um, uh, but, um, you know, so, you know, other cultures, other food, um, other languages, uh, I'd like to be the only American in the room if we could. Um, so, you know, that, that, that's, that's what I see as fun. Commissioner, do you want to jump in? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> you had to call me out, right? Uh -huh. um, uh, um, well, um, the thing I enjoy the most actually is my grandchildren. And um, I just love being with them, and they teach me all kinds of things. They're eight and um, six, and uh, they um, know more about uh, computers and um, technology, and uh, they have all kinds of games that I play on that computer that I would never do any other time. So I, um, I really, and I've gotten into the Avenger movies because they're into the <clears throat> Avenger movies. So I have to <clears throat> say that, and um, I've seen all the Avenger movies. Um, so, but I have an excuse because I have grandkids. So. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. So I, I do that for fun too. <laughs> oh, thank you, Commissioner. Uh, Commissioner Cunningham. Great. Uh, so um, I'm a physician. I'm a primary care physician trained in internal medicine and addiction medicine. And so um, prior to coming to um, OASAS, I had worked in the South Bronx in a federally qualified health center for over 20 years as part of Montefiore and Albert Einstein College of Medicine. And so providing care, you can imagine um, that many of the patients that I was taking care of used heroin. Um, and many of them had very unstable housing. Um, so for 10 years, I worked with a community-based organization called Citywide Harm Reduction, which is now Boom Health. It's a harm reduction organization. And I, as the physician, went every week for 10 years doing outreach to single-room occupancy hotels to reach people where they were. Um, and those were people who clearly um, were homeless and had HIV and used drugs. And so that was a huge, huge learning curve for me as a, you know, a young physician, really getting outside the walls of healthcare to where people who were at the mo you know, most marginalized um, really uh, could use help and where I felt like I could have a lot of impact. Um, and so really for me, that's where I learned a ton about housing, about social services, and you know what we now call the social determinants of health and the impact that it had on people that I was caring for, people with substance use disorders. And so um, it's through that work and that lens that I really come here and recognize clearly the need to address housing um, as part of care. Um, because we obviously know that, you know, taking care of addiction and other health conditions and just, you know, your life in general is uh, so challenging if you're unhoused. Um, so, so, you know, I think that that's certainly an interesting perspective and a lot of physicians don't have, but one that had a really huge impact on me, learning curve, and I really bring to the work that I do at OASAS. Um, so I've been here for six months as the commissioner. Um, so I've uh, been learning a lot about how government works. Um, and, and, you know, the vision that I really bring to, again, through my work uh, out in the community um, is really focusing on harm reduction. 
Um, so we know that more people are dying of drug overdose than ever before on record in this country. And so using a harm reduction approach, we have to keep people alive, period. And then we can talk about everything else. And so really approaching all the work that we do with a harm reduction lens uh, is really critical. Um, the second part of my vision is to use an evidence-based approach and a data-driven approach. And so we know, for example, that um, housing first is an evidence-based approach, right? We need to incorporate these principles into the work that we do and really think about how we use our resources in ways that we know we're going to get, uh, that, that are going to be effective when we know we're going to get positive outcomes. And so really critically thinking about what we fund, what we do, and making sure that there's clear evidence in terms of its effectiveness. And then using the data that we have to guide where, where our services are, who we're targeting, right? Um, because we want, again, we want to be the most impactful and reach the communities that need the most help. And so we, and, you know, we really need our data to guide us in that process. And then the third part of my vision um, is, to, is to really think about what we use through an equity lens. So I'm sure I don't need to tell many of you that in this country, substance use policies have been extremely racist. We have to acknowledge that and we have to address that. And so really bringing an equity lens, again, to the work, who gets funded, where the funding happens, who the target population is, et cetera, um, we, we, have to, we have to write what uh, has historically been wronged. And so for me, that's really the vision that I bring um, to OSS, harm reduction, a data-driven and evidence-based approach, and using an equity lens in everything that we do. Um, so I'm, you know, I mean, housing is not a huge part of what we do at Oasis, but clearly it's, you know, important. Um, and really thinking for us, too, about a across the continuum, how do we reach people who need our help? And, you know, my work, as, as you heard, it's going outside of the walls of the healthcare, right? That's so, uh, such a big challenge is that people can't make it to us because of the social determinants of health. And so we have to make sure that we can bring life-saving treatment to where people are. Um, and, and so whether that's on the streets, whether that's in shelters, whether that's in supportive housing, all of those places, right, where, where we can really make an impact. Um, my fun fact um, is uh, when I went to college at the University of Northwestern, uh, I played college softball. Uh, it was many, many years ago, and so uh, I grew up as a kid playing every single sport, and that has uh, really uh, shaped me as a person. Um, and I'm really proud to say that Northwestern is in the College World Series. <laughs> uh, their first game is on Thursday. It's on ESPN. <laughs> so I'm very excited and very proud of my alma mater. So you're going to suit up, right? Like you watch it. <laughs> Okay, Debbie, would you like to? Sure. Um, so I know you all were looking forward to hearing from Ruthann, um, but she is not feeling well. So you have to hear from me. I can't yeah. tell. To have I can't you. tell her wonderful story. I mean, I have worked with her um, for the most part since 2000, and I think it was 2006 when we met at HPD. Um, and then I worked with her when I went on to the Governor's Office of Storm Recovery, which was under HCR, um, and now I am working with her again, um, overseeing development and finance at, um, at HCR. So, um, you know, my story, similar to Ruth Ann, we're both urban planners. Um, you know, I don't think it's an accident that I am uh, a planner working in affordable housing. Um, I think, you know, what I bring to this job is a, my personal experience, um, and then over the last, you know, however many years I've been doing affordable housing, but particularly in this current role, um, what I have learned from you all, um, I think has only made me a better houser, um, a better planner, and actually I think a better um, parent as I try to impart what I learn on my, ch um, on my children. 
Uh, so, you know, I was a child who, even though it was a short period of time, experienced homelessness. And for those few months, the long-lasting impact, I mean, I'm 45 years old, and the impact has, this happened when I was 14, it's, it still has stayed with me. Um, and just seeing uh, family members struggling with homelessness, um, serious mental illness, a brother who is a paranoid schizophrenic, uh, substance abuse, you know, I bring those experiences with me, but um, there are so many things that I did not know until I started working, particularly at HCR, with Julie, with Brett, being involved with, um, with, the, with the Ishai um, working group and all the projects that we're funding. Um, it just really brings everything home and, and you know, kind of, it, it, all, it all makes sense. Um, and so I just, because I was just asked to be on this panel maybe an hour ago, I'm just gonna go. <laughs> I have, I have some notes on my phone, if I can just remember my password. I hope my <laughs> kids probably changed it. <laughs> um, so yeah, so. yourself and grandchildren. <laughs> um, so, you know, at HCR, our mission is to protect and expand the supply of affordable housing. Um, and, you know, we, our, our goals, are to you know end inequality in housing, um, end the racial wealth gap, uh, eliminate racial and financial segregation in neighborhoods, uh, breaking down the digital divide, you know, investing in sustainable pro uh, projects, um, and just guaranteeing that all New Yorkers uh, are able to live in the communities in which they want to. So, you know, and this 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 responsibility. It, it doesn't. It doesn't go away. No matter how hard we work, it just keeps um, increasing. Uh, and, and you know, we are just trying to use every tool in our toolbox. Um, one of those tools uh, is Ishai. Uh, it's in a, it's six uh, six funding round, um, and this just warms my heart. I love. Yeah, it. that's really lovely. <laughs> <laughs> I brought my kids to ribbon cutting a, a week ago. I love this. Um, so to date, um, of the 9,200 supportive homes that we've awarded since the beginning of the housing plan, nearly five years ago, uh, 6,500 of them are Ishai funded. Um, and so we, you know, we plan to continue to build on Ishai. Um, uh, and in the new housing plan, I mean, I'll talk a little bit about that later, but there's new funding um, in the housing plan for supportive housing. And you know, I just look forward to working um, with all of you and collaborating, so we can meet all of our goals. I think. Thank you. And we, you see, you're doing. See, you're doing great. The. Um, I agree. We should all. Yeah. It's. It. Uh, it strikes me in particular um, uh, that uh, something that. Um, Commissioner Cunningham said she's only been on the job for six months and she's learning about how government works. And I think what is, as someone who covered government in all levels for two decades, what's really unique about the people who are on this panel and the people in this room is uh, the ability to be less siloed than usual and the similarity of the goals of all the individuals who spoke here uh, and the um, juxtaposition and the intersection of what you are speaking of and the recognition of the importance of the work that you do toward the goal of housing people and keeping them housed and keeping them safe and keeping them alive is uh, really unique. And the work that you all do is really unique in, within the confines of government. And I don't think that we recognize that enough. Uh, it is very unusual to have people who are all heads of different agencies and at the top of different agencies speaking I would argue with one voice towards a common goal. So it's really um, heartening to hear from a person who was incredibly jaded after covering <laughs> two decades of government. Um, I think that uh, we, it is, and, and um, uh, we, we heard about the, the unusual, it was an unusual budget, certainly, um, with an enormous amount of resources. How long that will last, it's unclear, because the, a lot of it was because the feds you know, poured a lot of money into the state as a result of the pandemic and pandemic relief, which disproportionately impacted the individuals that were trying to hit, assist, as we all know. 
And there was, um, you mentioned uh, a really unusual budget year for mental health, and then there was a brief mention of ESHI. So can we just expand, and then also expand on sort of the housing plan within the confines of the budget and what was it succeeded or what, what the success was in terms of ESHI? It really was, it was great to see the, this approach. I think a lot of people were encouraged. Um, Commissioner Teets, or do you want to start with that? Or, do you, or sure. anybody can start, jump right in. Um, yeah, I mean, just speaking about our, the supportive housing component yeah. um, that sits with OTDA, um, which is also a way to say that. You don't have to do all I know. But, um, <laughs> so not fun. <laughs> so not fun. Um, but uh, HHAP, so the Homeless Housing Assistance Program, um, provides a source of funding for a portion of the 7,000 units. Uh, in the last year, in 2021, uh, uh, HHAP completed construction on just about 800 units. Um, housing about uh, 1,450 people. Um, in the new budget, um, we expect to include um, about 100 and, uh, well, $128 million for HHAP, which I think is what it was in the previous year, mm. um, which will allow us to continue to focus on development of new units. Um, so um, for sure, it's a, it's a great program doing great work. And then, and similarly, I mean, those, those targets are laid out over the next five years, is that correct? Yeah. Five years. And similarly for OMH, is that right? Yeah, though that's the, um, the Eshai dollars. And of the Eshai units that have gone up um, most recently, it's about 30% are, um, the, are for SMI. But there was also in the budget this year a lot of dollars to support the infrastructure of um, housing, uh, supported housing. And I think... You know, many budgets do a lot of, they add things, but they don't look back and say, what should the infrastructure be? Right. I mean, what, where, if you don't have enough money to keep going what you've already built, then how are you going to go forward? And I think the beauty of this budget is that it really works very hard at that. So there's the $65 million, which is coming for just to, to help with the basic service rates for um, housing, which is tremendous, um, and $39 million already committed for next year, so that it shows a kind of a trend and over... Since um, I've been in this job, it's about 155 million that's gone in now to housing over the last five to six years. So that's pretty impressive. I know it still can be hard in some areas, especially for some clients who need really special services. But that's a huge investment. There's also um, the cola, the 5.4 percent cola, which is a big, uh, and the 1 percent, um, 1 point something percent increase in the minimum wage. That also supports supported housing and gets the dollars out there. There's also the $60 million in capital that is again this year that we've had last year and we'll probably have again. And that enables us to keep the structure of some of the buildings and things in good shape. So that's in the budget. And also what's been looked for for a long time, which is the pass-through for supported housing. Um, you know, if we used to, we have it for our, some, some of the housing, but not for the supported, apart, for the unlicensed OMH housing. And now that pass-through of dollars, which gives a kind of incremental increase every year, is now on the books for the unlicensed housing as well. So that's huge in terms of keeping some of these incremental dollars going forward. So the infrastructure, huge. And then this year, about 1,600 new units coming up, something like 1,650 new units will be there. And then there's the Eshi dollars, which are there, which, um, again, um, will be going out for a new RFP soon. Um, and then and again, there'll be more. So the investment in, in housing is really um, quite remarkable. And I think with what we've got in the base now, um, we're at a point where we can build um, successfully over time. And will we, there be, um, I mean, obviously everybody wants sort of these improvements to, and the new dollars to be seen yesterday. <laughs> of course, that's not uh, going to be the case. But in the next sort of six months, will they become evident or the rollout plan is... Yeah, they should be starting. Actually, the um, six, the uh, money is coming directly from the state, six million. That should be very soon. That's that's very close. Um, the cola is close. There were some incentives. Um, the bonuses for staff that's probably delayed a bit. I think that that's going to come out though in this fiscal year, but it's delayed a bit. But a lot of the, especially the money that um, is directly in the budget will be moving very quickly. And then, Fabian, in terms of, and you, you talked about um, the, the commitment. I mean, we have all talked about the commitment, uh, seven years historic commit, seven years ago historic commitment to do 20,000 units of supportive housing over 15 years. And the state has now re-upped that commitment, and then some, 
a little bit. So um, where are we? And you talked a little bit about this. And then subsequently, uh, another five-year housing plan. So what are the highlights that we should be looking for, that folks in this room should be looking for? Sure. Yeah, I think I jumped ahead a little bit talking okay. about the numbers. Mm -hmm. um, but, um, you know, we funded, you know, more than 9,000 supportive housing units. Um, about 52% are located in New York City in the last housing plan. Um, and our new housing plan uh, has a, uh, continues to have a significant commitment to supportive housing. Um, I'm doing these off the top of my head, but I think I have them right. I think it's $1.5 billion um, in, um, in our supportive housing program. Um, and that commitment is to create um, 10,000 10, supportive housing units um, but the, the, the difference in this, uh, in this allocation or in, in this um, appropriation is that we are going to, um, I think our goal is to develop like 3,000 um, uh, preservation units, so preserving 3,000 units of existing supportive housing. And so that's not something that we did in the last housing plan. Um, focus was on new, on new units. So, um, you know, that's something new. Uh, we are, I feel like maybe I'm jumping ahead again, but, you know, Go we will it. have to develop <laughs> a new term sheet for that. So um, that is that is in the works. Um, I think just in general, I mean, it's a $25 billion housing plan. We're going to create 100,000 um, affordable units. There's four $4.5 billion um, uh, in, in capital funding that's going to fund our subsidy programs. So there's SHOP, the Supportive Housing Program. Um, you know, there's a, a billion dollars for new construction. Um, there's senior housing, home ownership. Uh, you know, we were very lucky to receive funding for all of our existing programs. Um, and then there are a few, like, new programs, um, ADU, we have money for electrification, um, and then Honda. So last year, last year's enacted budget, um, so we received $100 million for um, hotel and commercial conversions, and that money was, um, was restricted to New York City. We received another $100,000, I'm saying $100,000, $100 million, because what, <laughs> what are we building for $100,000? Nothing, nothing. <laughs> No wonder, no wonder you all are like, what is she talking about? $100 million. Now we have $200 million for hotel and commercial conversions. Um, and it's all, it's statewide. So I think that, uh, the last appropriation was fixed. Um, so that I think is going to be another, that's another example of how we are, um, how, how we are um, dedicated and committed to um, expanding supportive housing. And that uh, hotel conversion money is, it, it allows us to do this a little bit differently. I think we're taking a number of different approaches, um, and particularly in New York City, working with uh, HPD um, and, and, and DHS. Um, so it's kind of a nutshell. Yeah, and we should also note, though, it's, you know, it's like not soup yet, but the session's not over. So there uh, are a number of uh, policy matters that are moving through the uh, both chambers, some of them further along than others. Uh, the Senate, we think, is going to wrap things up this evening, maybe late this evening. And then subsequently, the Assembly, which is always a little bit delayed, more members, more more. Michigas, they will end up on uh, Saturday morning or maybe late Friday night. So, you know, there will be more, I'm sure, to discuss and uh, additional policy measures that um, either ancillarily, ancillarily impact this community or, you know, directly impact this community. So there's definitely um, a, a really significant focus in, on housing, which, again, is, I think, not new, obviously, but more up, spread across various different silos. Uh, which is also encouraging, which sort of brings me to you, um, Commissioner uh, Cunningham, which is, does OASS have any specific housing-related projects like on the horizon as well? Yeah, um, absolutely. So, you know, our, our housing portfolio is certainly smaller, right, than yeah. everybody else's here. Um, but one of the things that we're excited about is new transitional safety units. Um, and so we are going to be... Um, uh, uh, using $6 million uh, to make available for these transitional units, so uh, up to 120 of them. And they're specifically for people who um, have substance use disorders, who are um, unhoused or at risk of being unhoused, and who are coming either from our residential treatment programs or who are coming out of correctional facilities. 
Um, and so, so that sort of transitional piece were, is new for us, and we're excited about that. Um, so, uh, you know, the, the payments are for current fair market rates. It also includes for case management and for furniture. And we've, had, we've heard feedback um, that there hasn't been enough money for some of these additional, you know, costs to really be supportive. And so we're coming out with a second round um, soon and really increasing the cost so that we can make sure that people are able to be successful um, with these units. Um, so that's one, one that we're excited about. And then, and then also just, you know, our work um, for people who are unhoused. And so, um, you know, there's been a lot of attention to specific parts of the state and of the city, as you all know, um, that we, uh, we have all really been working together and collaborating in a way that I think is um, very hopeful and maybe, uh, you know, different than previous years um, to really uh, make sure that people who are on the street or in shelters know that services are available. And so some of these include outreach into um, Harlem, uh, the Bronx, and, and uh, Midtown around here, um, so that, you know, working with outreach teams, supporting them, making sure that, again, th that people um, uh, have harm reduction supplies, know about the services that are available, facilitating access to those services, and, and doing this really in collaboration with city and state agencies. Um, one of the other things that we're about to also announce is a new um, shelter in reach uh, mm -hmm. program that's, again, exciting to go into shelters that are at the uh, those that are at high risk for overdose, both fatal and non-fatal overdose, uh, provide harm reduction education and material and toolkits, um, provide treatment on site as well in those shelters. Um, so, you know, again, in collaboration with city and state partners. So, you know, this very much fits into our harm reduction, really using the data. We know that overdoses are at such high rate in some, you know, sh shelters going to where people are and providing the services that they need to help keep people stay alive. So all the people on this panel are much too polite and smart to say what I'm about to say now. But we have a very unusual, we've had a political shift, I think. I mean, certainly the city and the state haven't always gotten along terribly well. <laughs> Um, and uh, also the city is a creature of the state that the city doesn't like to admit it and you know they don't work together terribly well in, and they haven't because of personalities in the past but we have new personalities and there has been a new spirit of collaboration I think and a new recognition of um, you know the interdisciplinary disciplinary focus that's necessary in order to bring to bear all of the resources that are available to help people who are in such dire need. So to that end, um, since uh, Commissioner Cunningham has sort of opened the floor for um, the way that the city and state are working together, um, commissioners, could you also discuss, like in your particular focus areas, how that's occurring as well? Like in OMH, for example, or in or in um, OTDA. I think one of the bi one of the big collaborations right now that's happening is our work with the um, a serious mentally ill homeless um, on the streets. And I think if we think back to all the things that we've done and we've accomplished, um, you know, the homeless, the, for those of you who live in the city, but also in cities across the state, there's probably an equal number of homeless, seriously mentally ill on the streets in New York City and an equal number across the rest of the state, about somewhere in the range of maybe 2,000 New York City, 2,000 across the rest of the state. And we haven't done a good job with this. We really haven't. But I think um, what you mentioned is what's critical, that if you're going to do a good job with this, it has to be a real collaboration between all the parties that are involved. And so one of the things we've been doing with the city is working on trying to engage and work very closely with those who are the most vulnerable individuals on the street. And so we have something called safe option support teams. And these teams are based on the kind of work that all of you kind of know about. It's intensive kind of work of engagement, helping individuals begin to get um, involved in the idea of accepting services and maybe accepting housing and housing first, if that's what's necessary, and really doing housing first which is something that we've, or we kind of say we do, but we haven't been doing, not, not for the most vulnerable individuals. So that, um, we've got four of those teams working now in conjunction with the outreach teams that are also working across the city for the homeless, which have been there for many years, in conjunction with the city putting up a number of safe haven beds for some of these individuals, in conjunction with the state um, financing 500 more supported housing units, 
um, so that individuals can come from the streets into housing or maybe uh, individuals who are in C the CRs move into housing and then opening up spots for individuals coming from the streets to the CRs. So basically, it's a real collaboration to look at the whole picture of why this problem has been so persistent and um, so difficult to solve. And you know, when I first started in this business, I was with something called Project Help in um, New York City, which was one of the first outreach teams for the homeless in those years in the 70s and 80s when individuals were in Grand Central. Remember the height of the homeless? And we, it's gotten better, but we haven't solved it. So I think that this is really an attempt of all the parties to come together. And I think that that's what's really the most hopeful about it, and in addition to the dollars to put up safe places for people to go, whether it's they're right into an apartment, whether it's into a safe haven bed, or to a CR bed, whatever will work. So that's, I think, one of the most dramatic partnerships that I've seen in a long time between state and city coming together to solve a, a problem which um, we all feel, you know, it just shouldn't be there in a nation like this. We shouldn't have this problem. So I think that that's very hopeful. Commissioner Yeah, Teese. I would add... Um, so, and in fact, today, right after this, although we can't make it because of this, but um, every two weeks there's a meeting among key city and state stakeholders on this very issue of, of subway uh, homelessness and street homelessness um, that's convened by the city's Deputy Mayor for Health and Human Services, uh, uh, Ann williams Isom, who's been terrific. I think we all think that this has been a very worthwhile effort. It includes not only us and the, you know, uh, Health and Human Services agencies, um, but it also includes the NYPD and the MTA. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I find General Lieber at the MTA to be great to work with in his team, and I think they've been extraordinarily patient and thoughtful about all of this. Um, uh, I think it's been a very focused effort on what we each bring to this. I think for context, I should note that um, OTDA does its work through the local social services districts. So there's 58 of them, there's one in every county and then one for New York City. Um, so that means that we both fund and oversee um, the city's Department of Social Services, uh, including DHS and HRA. So for context, um, so OTA doesn't do the work directly, but rather oversees and regulates and funds the work mm -hmm. done, in this instance, by DHS. So the teams that um, uh, Anne was just talking about are you know, teams um, contracted or directly staffed by DHS staff working with um, folks from the OMH um, and from uh, NYPD, among others, um, to engage folks on the subway. I think there have been some successes there. We obviously oversee um, shelter that's provided by DHS, um, uh, opening up a bunch more safe haven beds, um, so the lowest barrier entry um, to get folks services. Um, this is going to be a long road. I don't think anybody imagines, or nobody should imagine, that um, one and done, as in, oh, I took you off the subway last night, we're good now. Um, I don't think that's what's going to happen. Um, and I think, there's a, I think there's a great deal of realism about that among our, our city partners. I think we're all pleased to do our part on this. Um, uh, and um, I think it's been very worthwhile. Debbie, do you want to? Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, we work really closely with, with HPD, and I, I started in this role, um, it, well, with the city. It's not just HPD, you know, HRA, and DHS. Um, I started in this role last um, January, so it was in the previous administration. Um, and, you know, I, understanding, you know, that climate, I we were able to, you know, partner with HPD. Um, we for a number of reasons coming out of the pandemic. We had extra volume cap. Um, HPD maybe had subsidy for, or, for a project and we had volume cap. We partnered on a number of, of, of deals. Um, and um, many of, and I think in, in New York City, I mean, we will only fund um, senior housing or supportive housing. Um, so all the projects that we co-funded with HPD pr um, produce supportive housing units. Um, and I, I, I'm trying to remember off the top of my head, I think between December, March, and this coming June on the 4% side, maybe we did like four or five projects. And then, you know, we're always closely coordinating, you know, on, you know, uh, on, with our 9% RFP projects that are funded, um, looking to HPD uh, to, to, to partner where we can. I mean, obviously, this is a competitive process. But... 
to the extent that we can, we are coordinating, we're in close touch. I mean, I talk to Kim and, and Brendan and, and the rest of the team so often, and so does my team. And so, um, you know, it's a really, really great uh, working relationship and trying to work through tough, tough, um, tough issues. Like for one thing, um, referrals, Ishai, I think, allows for referrals to come um, not only from the shelter, and I, and I know that in New York City there's a, you know, there's a fear um, homeless problem a, a issue and um, trying to reduce the population in the shelters. Um, but then, you know, with the state us trying to also see, you know, what we can do for our populations that may not be in shelter. And so, but it's been, but we're working together, we're talking through these things. Um, and so I, I, it's just in this new administration, uh, just even more hopeful um, about, about the future. I, I should also, I, sh I didn't mean to be unfair. I think that the certainly for, even in the previous administrations, the people who were in these roles and who were working collaboratively were, were staff, for lack of a better term, were certainly doing what they could because they're all in, have, have a similar purpose. But it's easier when the people who are at the top who are, are not fighting with one yeah. another. So just to be clear, I mean, I think that there's a lot of good work that has been going on and is continuing to go. But when you have that impediment removed of you know, that competitive nature, I think it really makes life easier for everybody. So just to clarify, um, interesting that uh, a, a couple of things that have been touched on here, I mean, I, I just also, because I'm from upstate, so if you would indulge me for a moment, it is certainly true that uh, the homelessness crisis is acute in the five boroughs and something that we are all reading about and experiencing if you live here or visit here, but it is also equally um, prominent and prevalent in the upstate area, and we can debate where you believe the line is, but let's just say <laughs> Hudson Valley up, um, and, and, and uh, increasingly difficult, of course, because though we have a built environment with more room, we also have challenges that include transportation and access to care, et cetera. So I think, Commissioner Teets, I think you mentioned upstate, if you want to just start and sure. expand on that a little bit. No, you're, you're absolutely correct that, that homelessness is an issue everywhere. Um, certainly the scale of the increases in cost of rental housing, we I, I acknowledge right up front, I mentioned we're looking at a reform agenda, um, and among those things on the list is the shelter allowance, we realize it's not realistic um, and doesn't work any, it's not enough anywhere. Um, I would say that, um, <laughs> Now, now, don't get too excited too quickly. Um, <laughs> but, you know, m maybe we'll see something in the next budget. I'm not promising anything. Um, so, uh, and the, you know, the COVID, re you know, the end of the COVID-related eviction moratorium, so that was in January. Um, we have the Emergency Rental Assistance Program, um, largely federally funded, although in this budget, we got a huge $800 million in state funds for that. So we're pushing through that. Um, which has gone, I, I would note that 85% of that money has gone to the five boroughs um, and has gone to the, generally speaking, to the poorest communities in the five boroughs. Um, so all that's good. I, I would say that one of our challenges in the rest of the state is that only about half the counties actually have emergency shelter in the way in which folks in New York City would understand that phrase um, and otherwise use hotel and motel beds. Um, I think have challenges Siding shelters, um, uh, and I think have challenges around um, um, kind of what kind of shelter to build and where. Right. Um, again, there's need, but it isn't doesn't grow to this scale, if you will. Sad to say, uh, like in some respects, in terms of efficiency. So, if you're going to build a shelter, who do you build it for, and where do you build it? And what, all those challenges, right? So. Um, and some of those hotels and motels now have become more scarce because of an uptick in tourism and what have you. So um, it is definitely an issue for us. Um, we require each of the local social services districts to create a plan for addressing homelessness. Um, and uh, they coordinate activities with the local continuums of care. So you know, applications for HHAP or solutions to end homelessness or uh, NYSHIP, um, all require documentation of need from the local districts um, and or the continuum. And I think one of the advantages of HHAP is that it can be used to fund smaller projects, um, the kinds that would happen in some of those more rural counties that otherwise wouldn't qual qualify for low-income housing tax credits or financing. Um, they only fund larger projects. 
Um, but it, we, just, we did just update the regs with regard to um, the use of hotel and motel um, that require a bit more service. We didn't interestingly get any pushback from the local districts no. on that of any consequence. Um, uh, so it, I think we're moving in the right direction, but there are definitely challenges that are not just confined to New York City. Yeah. Does anyone else want to weigh in on the upstate versus downstate sort of challenges and how things are different there? Because I do, um, the Commissioner mentioned something that I also didn't want to uh, forget. Um, and also, uh, Febia mentioned um, when we talked about this new preservation focus which uh, for existing units, which is really amazing and I don't think should be overlooked because if people are in housing that's no longer meeting their needs or is no longer up to code or is crumbling around them, then they're going to need new housing and that is going to increase the, the pressure on the front end where it's actually a minimum minimal investment that can continue to enable them to stay where they are. And you talked about term sheets that are being um, created now for that. Are there any other new term sheets or uh, that people should be aware of that are coming? And I know this, I, I didn't want to overlook this even though we're a little out of order here, but um, that people should be looking forward to or aware of because this community obviously is cares about, cares about that. Yeah, um, we are going to be looking at, well, we are looking at all of our term sheets um, and revising them. I think the first couple are going to be the supportive housing term sheet shop um, and new construction. And the target is to, to revise those and get those back up on the uh, on our website um, beginning of July. Um, and then, you know, we're going to be looking at all of our term sheets and, 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 and revising them. Um, but the preservation term sheet is it's a big it's a big one um, because uh, I, from from what I'm learning a lot of these um, existing buildings may have been developed under older programs and so there's going to be we have to figure out the operating piece of this um, because it, it's it's not going to be paired with Ishai so that they, so we you know we're talking to Shinny um, and our uh, other um, our state partners, partners in the development community, um, to to kind of figure out what that term sheet is going to look like and how we actually how we actually do that be, do this because the operating piece is going to be um, extremely important. And just to add that the teams I was talking about in New York City, we're also going to be doing those in um, several cities upstate as well. Hmm. It's just that that funding is starting probably in um, the summer and we'll be building those teams. So it's not just for um, individuals, sadly, on the streets in the city, but in New York City, but across, but across the state. Uh, and also, could you talk a little bit about the, the interfacing between permanent housing and then like the transitional housing, how you're getting people into housing, where are they being placed, and do, we, do you feel like there is a higher level of care needed at this point that is not? I mean, I know a, a lot of reassessment is going on across the board, it sounds like. Yeah, and I think for many of our, I mean, you've all brought this up over the years, that there are populations that we work with that require um, increased assistance in housing. Um, and some of the individuals who've gotten involved in the criminal justice system, sometimes it's people who use a lot of substances. Um, sometimes it's um, the transitional age youth who are moving from younger ages into moving into housing. Um, so there's lots of special kinds of um, populations and we're looking at, and we'll be talking with you about this, about ways to think about funding enhanced services in some ways for those populations in housing. But it's not just the services in housing. I think we also have to look at the services that we help support you with clients in housing. So, and by that I mean the expansion of all our crisis services across the state, which is going to happen with the 988 number, crisis stabilization centers, cri more crisis teams, more ability to work with you when you are having an issue with a client that we can move in and be there. Intensive outpatient from our outpatient clinics, the HCBS services, the home-based and community-based services that we want to be coming from the clinics into individuals in housing. So there's two things going on. One is to increase your ability to support the people in housing, but the other is for the rest of our system to work with you to support the people in housing. And I think when you asked about a vision earlier, I think that's one of the visions here, that all the pieces come together. I think that we have not done as good a job as we need to, ensuring that our services reach into housing with you. And when you need help or you need assistance or if someone isn't going to their clinic appointment or if someone um, needs something extra, that the rest of the system should also be there to work with you in addition to the work that you do. So we're gonna be working very hard on that. And 
And we really need your um, assistance with how to put some of those things in place. I think our crisis expansion will help a lot with having those services available for you. So I think it's both ends of the spectrum, helping you do better, but also helping us do better to help you. And it also sounds like, particularly, <coughs> and uh, Commissioner uh, Cunningham, you mentioned this, but because of your background specifically, um, that, uh, and also the alarming rate of overdose uh, that we are seeing, which is really hitting sort of historic heights, uh, and the need, and a couple of people have mentioned it here, for housing first, uh, and, and because, as Commissioner, as Commissioner Sullivan said, it's housing, housing, housing. Everything stems from housing. You can't be stable without it. You can't be safe without it. You can't get clean if that's what you want to do without it. Um, do you see a role going forward for how Oasis can be more proactive working with some of these additional agencies to establish some of these housing opportunities? Yeah, I mean, I think, I, I certainly think that it's, it's absolutely in line with, you know, our harm reduction policies, like you're saying. You know, what, what I see is, um, you know, so both sort of bringing treatment to where people are, encouraging them, providing services. I mean, I heard transportation, you know, upstate, this is a really big issue, and this is an issue that we've definitely um, had a lot of investment and continue to invest going forward in terms of transportation to make sure that people can get to where they are. Um, and, 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 you know, and, and then for those people who are not ready for treatment, right, having real discussions about is still ways to improve their health and reduce their harms. And thinking about the policies around people who, you know, are not able to um, stop using substances, right? What do we do? Do we kick them out? Do we terminate our services? And we know that when, if, if that happens, then people are at extraordinarily high risk of overdose. And so we really need to think about working with, um, you know, all kinds of service provision to say, you know, relapse is part of addiction, it is expected. It's part of the, the, the disease. And so, you know, what we want to do is intensify services, not stop services, not kicking people out. And how do we do that? How do we work with you? And so it's really, you know, I think people are coming along and understanding that, particularly when, you know, more and more people are dying at high record, at, at, at the highest numbers we've ever seen. But, you know, 20 years ago, that was a lot of the policies, was like kicking people out because they relapsed, because that's part of the disease. So these are the kinds of things that I think we really need to rethink and happy to, you know, help providers, you know, what is harm reduction, what does that look like in practice, how do you handle things when, you know, somebody does relapse or you know, uses drugs or is not doing exactly what we all want them to do or think that they should be doing, how do we still work with people in that situation. And so it's a paradigm shift, you know, but we, we, can't, we can't do what we were doing 20 years ago if we're going to actually solve this problem. We have to think out of the box. We have to be creative um, and do things differently if we're really going to, you know, bend the curve on overdose. And do you also need to redefine what solving the problem looks like? Absolutely, absolutely. And so, you know, focus, you know, as a physician, I can tell you this. A lot of the p people that I have taken care of uh, are not perfect, of course. Um, and, may and maybe they don't want to be perfect, right? And so maybe the goal is reducing use or, you know, s uh, you know getting it a job, right? Or keeping their family members, right? I mean, and that can be success without focusing only on abstinence. Right? Abstinence is just not the only goal. And so to that end, and uh, you know, I, I, before we leave this particular area, um, there's opioid settlement money. It's out there, right? And it's available, but what, to, what are the parameters around it, and to what degree can, might we be able to utilize it for housing, for supportive housing, and for some of these services to, to assist the people specifically who were harmed or who are in the position to be harmed by opioid use or abuse? Yeah, so, you know, you can imagine I get this question I pretty bet. much everywhere I go. There's money. <laughs> How can we get it? <laughs> yes, <Yeah>. exactly. <laughs> yeah. um, right, so, you know, we have an opioid settlement advisory board um, that is critical to helping guide uh, in terms of recommendations to the state on how to use the dollars. Um, so the board is actually going to meet, uh, our first meeting is in two weeks, 
Um, and so we know that already sort of with the legislature and, and the governor, there have been um, uh, some uh, of the funds have been allocated, and so we're going to be working with the board. We expect them to consider, for example, expansion of uh, treatment, uh, particularly mobile methadone units, which I'm very excited about. Again, going to where people are, going to the location. So this might look like mobile units going to shelters, right? Going to where jails are. Um, and so th this is a new pot. So let me, I'm, I'm very excited about this because this wasn't even possible until the DEA changed their regulations just in the last um, few months. And so with these sort of changes in regulations, we really want to move on these and bring, again, services to where people are. Um, overdose prevention is also a big part of this, so expanding naloxone, really getting in the hands of everybody in the community to save lives, addressing workforce issues. This is yep, another one that. we know about. Yep. Transportation, as I mentioned, um, and non-medical transportation, so not just going to treatment, but what you need you know, to get your job to help with your kids, et cetera. We know that's a big issue. Transitional housing, uh, we know that that's there as well. And, um, and then services for handoffs, so from EMS, from emergency rooms, from jails, getting people linked into care. So those are the areas right now that we expect the board to consider. And then there's you know, another $45 million that has not, doesn't have specific allocations that we're going to be working with the board uh, in terms of the recommendations. So there should be a report in November of this year from the board in terms of recommendations. And, you know, as, as many of you know, I mean, we don't even know how much more money is coming in from all of the yeah. settlements, right? They're still all ongoing. So for the future years, um, you know, we'll, we'll see how, how much additional money comes in. But, the, you know, the, the board is there to definitely advise us in terms of making those decisions. I, I should also note, well, two things. First of all, the commissioner, Commissioner Teats has his own, he's traveling. I, I hope you're all traveling with Narcan in your bags. I, I do. I take it everywhere. <laughs> you really do. I do really. And um, it's really not hard. To, even I've been trained to use it. It's really not hard. If, um, and everybody should really avail themselves of those um, very basic training programs, and it, you never know when it's going to come in very life-saving use. And the other thing I think I would be remiss if I did not know that from a transportation standpoint, you know, I, do, I did sort of cavalierly say, oh, upstate, it's a big problem. It's a problem in the five boroughs as well. There are underserved communities that can't get from point A to point B, yeah. which, and that means you can't get to your methadone program or you can't get whatever yeah. it is, right? So certainly that there, I mean, the New York Times did this, huge um, story like in the last week about the slowest bus in Queens, right? It's the slowest bus in the system. So I think that that also needs to be a recognition that it's not merely an upstate problem. Um, and I do, so I, we want to make sure that we get to questions. We, we're running a little bit behind, but I do want to hit on the workforce question or the workforce issue because I know it's of such importance to everybody here, to everybody in this, in this conference, um, because unless we address the burnout problem, and, and the retention problem, we are just, we're not gonna be able to provide the services that uh, people need so desperately. And um, the vacancy rate is crazy. So the, the COLA, 20%, um, uh, as, high, as high as 20%, and I think um, the COLA was really encouraging uh, at the state level, and it was great news. Um, this isn't the city panel, so I get to focus on good news, which is nice. Um, but also, I mean, do we think, are there other long-term or short-term plans in the works to address this? I know there's a recognition, so everybody knows it's a problem, but what more could be done aside from COLA, which was important, obviously? Well, I'll note that OTDA did provide um, what we would refer to as hazard pay, uh, so there are contract amendments um, during the pandemic that allowed us to you know, pay a bit more in bonuses for staff. Um, uh, I'll note that in NYSHA, you know, we recognize that it's a really essential program in upstate. It may be the sole source of funding. Um, our aim is to provide a sizable increase to grantees this year due to an additional $2.8 million um, in the budget being available. Um, and so I'll have... I'm hoping to have more to say on that soon. I think each of us is hoping to have more to say on some other adjustments soon. Um, we'd anticipate that for NYSHA programs funded in the city that there would be a match. The increase in the city would be even larger than it would be elsewhere in the state as mm -hmm. a result of that. So, um, but I, I think a lot of this is about valuing the work that human services staff does. 
um, and restructuring salaries and benefits accordingly. Um, and you know, we each see that need that there, this has to be addressed. I think, and um, collectively and and comprehensively. Um, uh, and um, I'm, I would aim to say that we're going to work on that. Okay. Anyone else want to address this one? I mean. <laughs> I think I think the other thing too is just how do for us how do we attract people into this field mm. is another really big issue and so you know we're thinking about um, I mean just all you know trying to creative ways to that that are incentives and so you know some of these include fellowship programs from as early as high school all the way through like medical school and residency to get people interested in the field um, you know having scholarships right for to get for the coursework and for the certification. Um, you know, uh, having um, scholarships paying for people to go back and get additional education so that they can, you know, continue to advance in the field. So, you know, we, we, this was certainly one of the priorities, and we got our um, most recent federal block grant, uh, supplemental grant. The first thing we did is we spent $19 million on workforce issues. I mean, that was the first thing, because we've, we know this. We've heard it. And, and I personally, I, I work in the hospitals in the Bronx during COVID in 2020, so I know what it was like and, you know, ended up changing jobs, coming to public health. And so, I know, you know, I, um, it's so real. I know you all know that. We all know that. And um, we need, you know, long-term change. I think all of us are really pushing for that. And then in the meantime, for the short term, really trying to come up with creative ways to bring people into the field and keep people in the field. Yeah, and just to add, I absolutely agree with what Dr. Chinazo just said. You know, we, uh, for a number of years, we've had a program where we just, it's actually a small stipend, I think it's like about $500,000 for social workers in training to just get some experience in evidence-based practices, mm -hmm. and they get a little stipend, and it's with the social work welfare schools across the state, and it's been remarkable how many people have then been interested. We get like a 10 15% yield just from that. So I think these pipeline initiatives really work. So one of the things we're looking at, similar to what Chinazo said, is looking at um, tuition reimbursement for people who are going through and special <laughs> fellowships, fellowships from communities to recruit minority students and students who are black and brown to come into the system because we don't have enough. And we're also looking at working with the high schools. We've also got some um, initiatives going with SUNY and CUNY to do some uh, specialized um, programs that can entice people in early tuition reimbursement, but also perhaps some certificate programs that could then lead to degree programs through the community colleges. So I think that's a long-term solution, but um, I think it's the only way. We we've never had enough people in our field, and we've never paid well enough. I and mean, we're paying a little better, but I don't know that we'll ever pay salaries like uh, Wall Street and other people who can really attract people. So you really need to do this kind of work. The tuition reimbursement um, also, the governor put in the budget for nurses and for um, yeah. uh, physicians um, uh, um, across uh, who are working in the mental health field. Um, that kind of thing is something that I think would be important for all kinds of titles. That kind of tuition reimbursement is kind of doctors across New York and nurses across New York. I think that those kinds of programs get people into the field. And my experience is if we can work with more of you too in terms of giving people that experience, that learning experience um, when they're in their schools. And we'd like to set up those kinds of, in quotes, fellowships where people could go and learn what a housing, what happens in a housing um, you know, provider, why would you do this work? Why is it interesting? Um, so teaching and supervising, huge way to get people into the field. So I think we're all going to work together on figuring out how to entice people into the field in that way because the money isn't, um, we have to pay, we have to pay good salaries. But that's not what attracts people to the work we do. No. It's because you love the work. But if you're never exposed to the work, you don't know if you love it. So I think we need to try to get young people uh, kind of exposed to the work. So slightly behind, but I um, want to open it up for questions. If you have any, please come to the microphone in the middle of the room. If you are not able to reach the microphone, please raise your hand, and we will try and get a microphone to you. Please do, yes, yes, adjust the <laughs> microphone. <laughs> Sorry, it's not for all. It's not at a height that's friendly to everyone. Please. Go ahead. So Joanne Page, the president and CEO of the Fortune Society. First, thank you for the good news, the news about the COLA, the news about how you're keeping the New York, New York 3 
supportive housing from midway, you're catching it as it's falling off the cliff, mm -hmm. as organizations can't survive because the rent money rises and the dollars don't. So thank you for those. Um, we work with people in the criminal justice system and we've developed a continuum of housing for homeless folks. And at this point, it's a tragedy because more than 50% of the people released to New York City from New York State prisons are released directly to the shelters. Mm. And there is no real way out for most of them. Uh, Commissioner Teets, you sent shockwaves through the room <laughs> because a primary driver of homelessness is, my God, $215 a month for rent in New York City. Uh, and that, that's just criminal. But what I really want to say is that New York State has improvised because the doors are closed for people with criminal justice background, especially those just coming out of incarceration, the doors are closed for most permanent supportive housing. And Ishai, because it requires chronically homelessness, um, and nobody coming out of state prison is chronically homeless, and almost nobody coming out of jail is chronically homeless. And Ishai, unlike 1515, which requires chronic homelessness, is just focused on need. But what I would ask is that you look at the dollars available for Eshi, because $25,000 a year isn't enough in New York City. And you've improvised by letting us use Section 8 to supplement the rent, but New York City is not giving Section 8 vouchers to supplement the rent. So if people are looking at the bottom line in developing supportive housing, they're going to go for 1515, which excludes people in the criminal justice system because the dollars just don't work uh, in terms of Eshi for New York City. So thank you. Thanks, Jan, nice seeing you. Um, and, and, <laughs> And I'm familiar, um, as you know, from my prior city government role. Um, and I largely share your view um, that there's a thing to be fixed here. Um, so we'll, we'll absolutely mm -hmm. take a look. Mm -hmm. Good afternoon. Thank you. Uh, I'm Kevin O'Connor uh, from Joseph's House and Shelter. Um, and, uh, but prior to that, I've, I've been doing homeless services work for 35 years now, 34, starting in New York City and moved upstate. So um, amen to a lot of what we've heard today about expansion of housing, about shelter allowance. Uh, thank you for NYSHIP, by the way. Uh, it's a legacy program I think the state should be proud of, and I think we've fallen way behind in, in, in support. And for some strange reasons, that's the only program that didn't get COLA this year. So mm. I'm glad that somebody's talking about that and trying to do something about that. Um, and, and really thank you for the coordinated effort that we're talking about here. Um, it really, really makes my heart feel great. Um, one thing that I, I think we need to talk about in upstate New York, if we really want to make homeless services available to the most vulnerable people, I think we've got to look at how shelters get paid. Um, in upstate New York, different than the city, um, it gets paid by DSS per diem reimbursements primarily. And most of the folks that we work with in street outreach, which has doubled since the pandemic, we see this month we, we've serviced 347 individuals for the year, about 1,400. It's about double what it was pre-pandemic. And a lot of those individuals are not DSS compliant. Uh, they have no interest in going DSS. A lot of them, a lot of them have a, a difficult issues with intimacy regardless of a bureaucratic system. So I think, we, and it would be a big job, but I think we've got to look at how shelters get paid if we really want to focus on the most vulnerable people that Ann was referring to that we serve in our outreach programs every day. So thank you. I'm sorry, t tell me, t t t tell me uh, which, which county? Which county? Uh, Albany and Rensselaer. Albany and Rensselaer, yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Hi, Kevin. Mm -hmm. 
Hi, I'm Alicia McFarland. I'm the Chief Program and Legal Officer at Samaritan Day Top Village. Um, first, as always, I want to echo what Ms. Page has said. <laughs> um, at Samaritan, we do, we have OMH-funded programs as well as OASIS-funded programs, and we have a large portfolio of transitional housing, families, and single shelters. Um, I'm wondering what work has been done in collaboration with the city to close the gap with chronic homelessness from our, for our clients that are in our treatment program. So often when they complete treatment or near the end of treatment or meet what is their defined successes, they are not eligible for the city vouchers for housing. Has there been any work or collaboration with the state and the city on trying to close those gaps? So you're referring to the city and state vouchers, like for HEPs, for example? Exactly, or any other emergency vouchers. And you say they're not eligible because? They're not chronically homeless, they're not at risk of homelessness by definition because they're in treatment mm -hmm. and housed yeah. within our programs. I can't answer that here today. Um, we'll certainly take a look. I'm aware, I mean, of course, the, mm -hmm. there are um, eligible requirements for getting those vouchers that generally require a, a shelter stay, as you know. Um, yes. And so the loss of prior housing and et cetera. So there's a bunch of rules around who gets those. But so what you're really asking here is for a voucher for others, for people who are not in that circumstance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, I mean, it's, it's very unfortunate. We work really hard to have a full continuum at Samaritan, yeah. so we do have housing shelters, but to have someone meet what by their treatment goals are is a success for them, and then say, well, now yeah. you have to go and become officially yeah, yeah, yeah. undomiciled mm -hmm. and go into mm -hmm. one of our shelters, yeah. it, you know, mm -hmm. it's very unfortunate. Yeah. It's a huge I, I appreciate the perverse incentive of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. Hi, um, my name's Katrina. I'm with Shout, the supportive housing um, organized in United Tenants. Um, too many questions to ask, so little time. But the one I'm going to ask is um, basically like the accountability for the providers. Uh, right now, supportive housing grievances process has not really been taken seriously for many of us. Um, I'm kind of chuckling because I've never gotten a call back from HPD from uh, 13 months ago. Um, but when I even called 311, 311 sent me to NAMI. NAMI and I laughed because NAMI doesn't refer to like housing issues. Like, you know, I have a problem. I needed to call 311. 311 sent me to NAMI. NAMI helped me with the phone numbers for um, like health and mental hygiene, we found out they were not my housing provider. I needed to call HPD, and then HPD gave me a ticket number, and I never heard anything back again. Um, so I finally was able to get a grievance form. 24 hours later, the grievance form was slipped back under my door with nothing on it. No signature, no follow-up, no sign that it was even received. Um, this is like an example of a slap in the face for the tenants. We need our own advocates or someone that we can contact to deal with the issues that we are facing in supportive housing. Why don't we have an independent third party monitor in supportive housing to treat our concerns seriously? Concer like housing concerns, like broken pipes. I mean, there's so many different types of concerns in supportive housing. Um, and what can be done to establish real accountability for supportive housing providers going forward? Some supportive housing providers will literally be, I really hope you can go find a community organization to help you because I am, provo I am promoting your independence. And that's their definition of supportive housing, which was not what I agreed to when I accepted a supportive housing. It was like, congratulations, here's a place a mile away. We're not going to give you a Metro card. You know, let me know how you do. Mm -hmm. That to me is not supportive housing. So um, I really hope there is a way that we can do this because we have dozens of examples, every shout meeting of different things we are trying to get, um, like different grievances, but all we do is like share them with each other and we wanna know who to share them with, where it will not just be another blank paper returned under our door. 
or a you know unanswered email 13 months later. Thank you. Take this off. Hi, my name is Emily Hamilton. I um, I work in Kingston, New York, Ulster County, uh, for Rubco. And as Debbie knows, we're working on a hotel conversion. Um, we're going to be putting in an application to HHAP, and so I have an easy question, and then I have a comment. Um, so the easy question is: Is there, there going to be a new RFP for HHAP? Or maybe not so easy. Um. The RFP for HGP is currently active and open. Okay. It's been rolling over right. Over right. So that hasn't changed. All right. We've already submitted a concept paper, so we just have to submit the application. Uh, and then my comment is um, something that my CEO has said several times, and I've been wondering myself: um, Is there any way Ishai could ever be used for existing units? Other than I know, I know there's money now for preservation um, of supportive housing units, but. And I know there's regulatory agreements <laughs> that perhaps maybe would have to be amended. I don't know if that's ever happened and would be changed in, you know, in the way, uh, you know, uh, housing is regulated in the state of New York, perhaps. But, <laughs> but uh, yeah, just wondering, you know, there's projects, there's a particular project I'm thinking of uh, in uh, Newburgh that um, we manage that possibly some of those housing units could be uh, homeless housing units. Hmm. So. Just some food for thought. Thank you very much for what you do. All right, um, so the short answer to that last question is no. Um, <laughs> but um, that doesn't mean that we would never contemplate it. So it may be worth our being in touch. Um, I'd be happy to hear ideas around this. I, I just want to know, I, we, I need to keep you guys all on time. So we have about four minutes. So I want to make sure we get to both of your questions. Hi, um, my name is Konstantin Dechkov. I'm from Postgraduate Center for Mental Health. Uh, I'm a regional director for um, Postgraduate. My question is about intersection between housing first model and also making sure the clients are actively engaging in services. One of the biggest issues that we have in our sites a lot of times is we house somebody and they stop, they stop getting services. They refuse to engage in substance abuse services. They refuse to engage in mental health services. They become highly disruptive to <clears throat> all the other members in the, in the building. Um, is there any conversation about combining the two, the housing first, with um, expectation that tenants will engage in services? Well, I think, just to add a little bit, I think that um, we're combining the two um, with these pathways to home, um, the pathways to home teams, that are, and with um, the SOS teams. Those teams, the ones I talked about earlier, will stay with that client in whatever housing setting they are in, and it is their responsibility to be working very closely with those clients to be able to be successful in housing. They'll be with them for up to a year or longer if it's necessary, to make sure that they get stable. I think what we need to do is work, that kind of wraparound is often needed for the most vulnerable, and that's why we're beginning to build those kinds of teams. Um, we've also du um, doubled the number of, put out 20 more ACT teams in the city, too, to work with chronic, uh, chronically mentally ill who should be able to help with the housing. In addition, though, I think what I said earlier, we have to work together to figure out ways that our system can work with you to make sure those clients, sometimes they need time to really accept services. I don't think you can demand that they sign on the dotted line before they get in, but we, with you together, not just you alone, are responsible for helping to engage those clients. These intensive teams have done good work with this. Um, so we're thinking of ways that we can expand those, whether someone's coming into housing from the street or coming in post-hospitalization or post other things where they're not quite stable yet, but they need housing, and then these teams work with them to ultimately accept services. We need more of that. That seems to work. So I know what you mean, though. If you don't have that, yes. sometimes it can be very difficult to, to work with some of these clients with a lot of challenges. So um, we can talk to you more about that, but we're beginning to expand those kinds of connections, which I think are very helpful in stabilizing people in housing. Thank you. Yeah, specifically, the housing providers, that'll be very helpful. Last one. 
Uh, good afternoon, my name is Rob Kane with CSD Housing out of Rochester, New York. I have a question for you, Thabia, if you're able to share. Uh, curious to know a little bit more about the potential new construction program and supportive housing program uh, term sheet revisions, if you're able to provide any more information on it. Um, not so much, because we're revising it now. I mean, I don't expect major, major changes. Um, so I think, you know, if you have projects contemplated, I think you should, you know, you can kind of continue on the path. I don't expect major, ter major changes. Ah, yeah. Mm. That's a good point. We do have new sustainability um, guidelines and design guidelines that are posted on our website now. Um, so keep that in mind because those are the new requirements um, for 4% going forward. Um, and then they'll be included with the 9% RFP that's going out in the fall. Great. Folks, thank before you. you leave, let's just thank everybody for their time. Thank you so much. Enjoy the rest of the conference.